And okay, now without further ado, uh, uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, invited speaker, Alessandro Ultramari. Uh, he will give a talk entitled Cognitively Inspired Decision Intelligent for um, Manufacturing. So Alessandro is currently president of the Carnegie Bosch Institute and a senior research scientist at Bosch Research Technology Center in Pittsburgh. Uh, he joined Bosch Research in 2016 uh, after working as a research associate at the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, at Bosch Research, he focuses on neurosymbolic AI and his primary interest is to investigate how knowledge-based methods and systems can be integrated with the learning uh, algorithms help, and help human and machines make sense of the physical and digital worlds. He holds a PhD in quantity science and education from the University of Trento, Italy, and he had a 10 tenure, um, 10 year tenure at the Institute of Quantity Science and Technology at the CNR, uh, the National Research Council uh, in Italy, where he maintains an uh, associate research uh, position. Uh, so, really, thank you, Alessandro, for uh, joining us, and we really look forward to your uh, talk. Thank you, Antonio, for the nice introduction. And uh, you know, uh, uh, I would have preferred to to be there and give this talk in uh, Palermo. Um, of course, as an Italian, an extra trip in Italy is never uh, too much. But unfortunately, things didn't work out uh, as expected. Uh, however, you know, I hope uh, I'll be able. At least to, to show you a little bit, uh, to give you an introduction <clears throat> of what we are doing uh, in our group here in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, today, do this, yeah. So, a little bit of outline for today, just uh, a couple of slides to uh, introduce you a little bit uh, uh, to our group uh, and to what we do. Uh, some motivations, an introduction on the use case, and um, the approach and methods uh, we, we are currently developing. And some about the future work. Um, I should also say that you know this project, uh, specifically focused on manufacturing, started this year. So we we made uh, definitely some progress, but there's you know long road ahead of us. <clears throat> uh, very briefly, just uh, to give you the context of Bosch Research in North America. So Bosch Research is present, uh, uh, you know, Germany, Europe, uh, in many countries. Particularly in the US, we have three research centers, uh, Sunnyvale, Silicon Valley, Pittsburgh, and Boston, uh, strategically located, I would say, uh, close to uh, uh, you know, a major university like Stanford and CMU and MIT. And we focus on different types of topics uh, from uh, IoT, cybersecurity, uh, human machine intelligence, uh, which is more or less you know, my, my area of, uh, uh, of interest and research. <clears throat> So, in particular, in Pittsburgh, we have uh, recently formed uh, um, a group we call CADI, uh, Causal Analysis and Decision Intelligence Group. Uh, so, the I would say the um, the uh, core methods that we we adopt uh, in this group uh, are based on neurosymbolic AI. Um, and there are symbolic AI, especially when you think about uh, you know companies like Bosch, uh, where there is a lot of uh, of course, uh, uh, um, policies and procedures and domain expert knowledge is captured in uh, in many type of structured documents, uh, and the combination of that with you know the data that uh, that uh, of course as a as a big company working in uh, across domains from uh, from uh, you know smart home to automotive, we produce uh, you know the combination of these two things uh, is very important. Um, Typically, when we look at the state of the art uh, and when we look at uh, industrial applications, either you find a lot of exploitation of, uh, I would say, data-driven methods, or you find a lot of approaches that are based on knowledge representation. But it's very utterly uh, uh, unusual to find a combination of uh, of both, I would say, and, and which is something that, again, neurosymbolic AI approaches uh, uh, allow. And in particular, we think that these are important for two areas of applications, um, causal analysis and decision intelligence. Uh, so currently, we are focusing on problems that relate that are more internal, I would say, that uh, that uh, user facing. Uh, so things like optimizing processes in manufacturing, cost savings, and so on. So causal analysis, which is not my field of interest, but is more like an, another colleague of mine, Corey Hanson, that is driving this in Pittsburgh. 
Uh, you may remember Corey's name from uh, the SSN ontology, the Semantic Sensor Network is one of the co-authors. Uh, and recently, you know, he's been investigating the, the, the let's say, um, the topic of causa causality uh, in knowledge graphs and how that can be um, used uh, to uh, for problems like root cause analysis for anomalies, predicting quality of products and uh, optimization of processes. Um, what I actually focus a little bit more uh, in Pittsburgh, let me see if I can minimize this. Oh, all right. Uh, I'll show you here. Um, is decision intelligence, and I'll you know discuss a little bit what what that means. But in general, it's the idea of uh, uh, you know different levels of support of humans in their decisions, and you know decision intelligence is uh, I think generally neurosymbolic uh, because it combines machine learning algorithms with knowledge graphs and rule based systems, where again the idea is to try to support a human decision. We apply this uh, uh, in a so-called uh, continuous improvement process, which is a um, say Bosch internal terminology that focuses on continuously improving uh, manufacturing processes and production processes, especially in the area of uh, flexible manufacturing. And when you ramp up the configuration of a, you know, on a of a factory, when you add a new uh, machine in a in a line, uh, um, uh, or you try to reconfigure some machines. This typically takes a lot of time unless it's guided by some sort of systems that uh, can predict some of the, the, the outcomes of these uh, changes in the line. Um, right, and so our our approach though, though we work in different areas, you know, say, you know, in a sense, you know, causal analysis for AI and, um, and decision intelligence. Uh, I think our unified approach is that we start from uh, uh, simulations, um, Especially because in the manufacturing domain, you know, we of course there are many uh, data sets that we can use and uh, and we can generate internally. But when we look at things like causal relations and decision processes, we don't have much ground truth. And so simulation frameworks are, are, are say the precondition for us to to uh, to generate uh, um, uh, some synthetic scenarios that we can use uh, to construct our neurosymbolic models that then are applied to many types. So different types of uh, uh, of uh, of tasks, um, and of course, you know, the idea is that uh, um, these type of models are not uh, uh, static, but can evolve over time, uh, uh, depending also on uh, on the type of uh, uh, feedback we can process from the environment and uh, and feedback uh, and into the overall the pipeline of the systems. <clears throat> Uh, so, as I said, I will, uh, you know, my area of focus is more decision intelligence. So uh, that's pretty much the the, uh, the context uh, of my talk. Um, and so, to be a little bit more precise, you know, what do we mean with uh, decision intelligence? And uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, this is uh, uh, just another buzzword uh, in the sense that you know the, this type of uh, problem and applications uh, have been around for quite some time. Uh, however, I like this distinction. Uh, you can find that paper mentioned on the left uh, between, you know, uh, within uh, decision support, augmentation, and automation. Where really here, it's really uh, so the the distinction is based on uh, um, uh, how much leeway is left to the to the human and to the machine. So decision support is a uh, is basically uh, so the the distinction between decision support and uh, AI analytics is very blurred because here. You know what a system does in this particular context is just providing some alerts, um, some some visual uh, aids for humans to make decisions. But the decision is entirely uh, up to the human, of course, in the particular task. Augmentation uh, in, entails that there are also some um, uh, recommendations that are uh, uh, generated by uh, the system. And, and it's um, uh, up to the human at that point to uh, accept or not those recommendations. And, um, uh, and potentially, of course, the acceptance uh, or not of the recommendation is also used by the system in future iterations uh, to improve over time. Uh, and this is more the area where, where I work uh, on. And, uh, you know, again, uh, very much along the lines of human machine collaboration. Uh, um, and decision automation, I mean, I think, you know, you can look at it as a sort of uh, for, uh, you know, for um, for decision tasks is the, the is uh, corresponding to what would be level four autonomy for self-driving cars. So here, basically, the human is just 
uh, is just monitoring the risks but uh, or, or of decisions that are taken autonomously by by systems and only steps in if there are um, if there is any unusual activity uh, that requires uh, the human to step in uh, and this is far away i don't think there are, there are systems right now that you can deploy that can be fully automatic uh, uh, if uh, you know with the uh, systems that you can deploy we mean system that can be you, that you can deploy in uh, for making complex decisions because of course when we look at tasks that are more perceptual in nature we already have systems that uh, you know can decide if uh, uh, something is a, a person or a table uh, even in that case though we we see problems of course uh, uh, but at least you know at the perceptual level uh, uh, what we see in terms of implementation is much more robust than the systems that had to consider uh, a vast amount of uh, domain knowledge uh, and combine that with uh, some real time data uh, like readings that you can get for, out from uh, from machines in a manufacturing facility but you know uh, other other domains uh, uh, have the same type of um, uh, limitations uh, thinking about you know uh, smart city domains uh, logistics and so on uh, talking about the landscape of let's say topics uh, and and companies that work in the area of decision intelligence, um, uh, the usual suspects are there. Of course, you know IBM started um, in, in in this area many years ago by implementing rule-based systems uh, and you know introducing um, over time uh, machine learning as a, also additional solution. Um, uh, and Oracle is present. Uh, I recently uh, was approached by a new startup uh, based on the UK. It's called Rainbird, where they actually uh, explicitly put an aerosymbolic AI, you know, in their in their solution, in their in their portfolio. Uh, Alibaba started a decision intelligence lab a while ago, uh, and the area of applications are the ones that you see on the left. I mean, some are underlined because they are more relevant for manufacturing. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, um, uh, power load forecasting is very important. Sustainability, um, market decision uh, making, also because you know the area of business analytics is uh, is very is, is very relevant for decision intelligence applications. Um, and so our solution uh, can be, let's say, uh, illustrated uh, by by looking at this you know figure. Um, where we basically you know the the neurosymbolic aspects here are, are uh, complemented by uh, a level uh, where that we assign to the cognitive architecture as a you know a, a, a focus where we try to capture not only i would say uh, the uh, explicit knowledge uh, of a domain or a problem or you know, distilled by humans uh, and uh, the learning aspects uh, that you can leverage using the current, uh, you know, most modern neural AI approaches, but also with the level of, uh, you know, what we can do out of these learning and knowledge uh, uh, levels uh, in a, a context where it's important to understand uh, how humans make decisions and to replicate those decisions in real world cases. Depicted uh, below by some of those pictures, you know that 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 show uh, uh, people in the plants. Uh, as plants become more and more complex, more and more automatized, uh, and where um, optimization uh, is the target, uh, um, the, uh, understanding how humans make decisions and try to uh, pair humans with systems that understand that and can uh, replicate it, uh, uh, it's very important. Um, and again, as a, as a main, uh, uh, I would say, um, the main focus here of our applications, at least so far, has been really, uh, I would say, um, based on re reduction of costs, which also mean reduction potentially of headcounts, so people working in particular areas, um and uh, the other the, the flip side of the of the uh, optimization coin is also try to uh, produce uh, a larger quantity of components or and also improve the quality and also the flexibility relies on the fact that uh, if you observe that some machines in a line remain Id uh, idle for for uh, too long 
then you can repurpose them uh, uh, and you can actually decide that as they are not used, uh, they could uh, manufacture other components of other type. And of course, uh, that is not an easy decision to make because there are specs, uh, there are you know uh, 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 production processes uh, to uh, to comply by, and so this is a becomes a very complex decision uh, um, point. And I will also tell you a little bit uh, where these decisions typically occur in the workflow that we are familiar with at Bosch. Uh, so why do we need a cognitive level? And uh, I put this slide here just uh, as a sort of, uh, I would say, meta motivation of, 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 of this work. So with the, with the, with my collaborators here in, in Pittsburgh and also we collaborate with um, uh, uh, some people from uh, from CMU, uh, um, professors here from Eric Nyberg, uh, uh, Jonathan Bisk and others. We've been uh, looking for quite some time now to the problem of how we can enable high-level reasoning in uh, um, in uh, uh, in AI systems, um, and we started actually in a in a pre uh, large language model era where I th we thought that uh, you know things like BERT were the largest models that could be available. And then, you know, you may be familiar with that type of uh, um, studies where, you know, uh, for instance, in question answering, you have different tasks benchmarking for common sense reasoning. And then, uh, you know, some models uh, perform very close to human uh, for data set X. Uh, but when you move to that, that, that data set Y, then uh, the performance drops uh, uh, significantly. And, that be, and that's because, uh, you know, what these models learn to do is just uh, Predicting uh, the the, the um, word distribution at scale in that particular data set, but when the word distribution changes, the prediction capabilities uh, you know uh, uh, become uh, become very very weak. And so we started that uh, to infuse to work on infusing more common sense knowledge into these models. <clears throat> For instance, introducing things like uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, concept net, word net, and then the superset of all common sense knowledge graphs like you know CSKG, which these days I think is still the largest common sense knowledge graph that exists. And still, you know, although we could demonstrate uh, um, that uh, across various data sets, uh, by infusing knowledge, you could uh, um, keep the performance stable, if not improving significantly, still, you know, our neurosymbolic uh, language models were not uh, capable of reasoning. Uh, they were just... Uh, Again, using the knowledge signals uh, coming from the graphs as uh, an additional, as like you know, a so, a sort of you know, uh, steroids for their word distribution, which of course uh, contain implicitly a lot of common sense knowledge, but was still not the same thing as reasoning with that knowledge. And you know, I liked very much what I heard from Ron Brackman last uh, spring at the AAAI Make uh, uh, Symposium, um, so on the integration between machine learning and uh, and, uh, and symbolic AI, where he, he basically said, you know, uh, we are focusing a lot on knowledge, but then when we look at reasoning, especially in common sense, what is missing right now in these models is, com is the usage of common sense, capability of using this knowledge dynamically for reasoning. And so that's where actually, you know, the work that I uh, started doing when I was a CMU working with Christian Lebier in, in various projects, um, came back to me and says, you know, I think, you know, we can use cognitive architectures to drive the reasoning mechanisms the, that are rooted on the, the neurosymbolic AI architectures that we are also uh, building. And, you know, what I show today is really the first steps towards that direction. So <clears throat> the use case that we are working on, just to be a little bit more concrete here, is called, you know, flexible manufacturing for optimizing production lines and, uh, and layouts, where a layout is uh, how machines are laid out in a particular plant. And uh, as I already mentioned um, in uh, pre uh, pre previous slides, the dimensions we are looking at are quantity, quality, time, and cost. And uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, as Bosch, but you know this is very more general than just Bosch. Uh, you know when we look at uh, optimization of operations in manufacturing, uh, you basically are looking at two temporal scales, uh, a micro scale and uh, and, and a macro. The micro is called morning round. So every day in a specific plant, uh, the plant manager revise uh, the processes of the pre pre previous, uh, previous days or weeks uh, and tries to identify uh, pinpoint problems in the line. Um, and this, of course, takes a lot of time. 
Um, and the, the most relevant, uh, I would say, time scale for our own solution, the solution that we are building at least, uh, is, um, is so-called workshops. So these uh, occur every quarter, sometimes every six months. And this is a gathering of all plant managers in a particular region, and sometimes it's cross-regional. Uh, so this is once a year, uh, I believe. And in these workshops, the uh, plant managers uh, look at uh, that have you know technical expertise look at uh, all the data that uh, were gathered in different plants and revise all these processes uh, at scale and so and and sometimes they don't have enough data because of course uh, they, they it's always true that we have a, a high volume of information but sometimes we also have a high volume of missing inf uh, information key information um and so and in this particular for this particular task at workshops uh, it's very challenging to identify what the problems are, and uh, and and this is where uh, you know uh, a support with uh, with AI systems that can understand human decision process is more relevant. So our approach of developing this neurosymbolic cognitive architecture um, is really uh, targeted towards improving the situational awareness of the human. So again, we are in the decision augmentation kind of level uh, of the tree that I introduced before, um, and uh, and. Uh, this is uh, this, of course, uh, as I said, uh, uh, is an integration of different methodologies. Uh, where I would say the last layer of integration is a, a large language model. A large language model, not be because of the reasoning capabilities that are still missing, especially when we look at domain level, but because it, it can provide, uh, of course, some advantages in terms of scalability, in terms of generalizability and explainability. Um, you know, our approach, uh, as you will see in a minute tries to, uh, so focuses on fine tuning uh, the last layer of a large model with the synthetic data generated by, by our cognitive model. Um, and um, the fact that you have a cognitive model that uh, can execute a complex task uh, of, uh, I would say, decision management uh, can also be used to transfer that model to other tasks that are not on the same domain, but that actually um, uh, are, can be described with the same features uh, at the higher level, at least. And, and also, you know, cognitive models like knowledge graphs are kind of, you know, uh, by default, by design, they are uh, uh, inspectable. So you can inspect them, you can elicit the decision steps. It is very helpful, of course, to understand where to intervene and where we can recommend. So where to introduce the recommendation of the system. And as some of you may have noticed, I mean, this this uh, uh, continuous improvement process has some similarities with the, the famous OODA loop, uh, you know, by John Boyd. Okay, so the task, uh, the, the the concrete task, I'm looking at the time, yeah, uh, is uh, can be that can be described with these bullet points. So we have a production line, a prototypical one, uh, that consists of two sections uh, with the potential defect sources and pre-assembly section and assembly. Some things here I don't have the time to explain, but you know, I think intuitively you can see where we're going. So a pre-assembly is you know, when we basically start a process that is a precondition for uh, assembling different components. Uh, and then there is an observation that pre-assembly takes 40 seconds with uh, this measure, which is uh, it's called OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, as the the words uh, are self-explainable here, it's a measure that gives you the effectiveness of the overall machines that you have in this plant. Um, and here is you know the effectiveness is uh, is pretty is pretty high, 88 percent. Then we have at the assembly stage uh, that takes 44 seconds, but there's a lower uh, OEE. And so where the the goal that we set is uh, reducing the uh, uh, total assembly uh, of four seconds. And so we need to identify here which section can be optimized with a minimal impact on the de on the defect rate, so on the quality of the component that we are manufacturing. And so another uh, factor here uh, is important to uh, to uh, uh, take into account is that reducing the cycle time will also lead to increasing headcount. So more people working on a particular machine in a station uh, uh, station in a line. Uh, and this is a prototypical description, I would say, a prototypical uh, diagram of the of the production line uh, that we um, that we can use it to summarize uh, the different stages uh, that go from body production to packaging. And you can see there the pre-assembly and assembly phase. 
And the tables underneath uh, are just a partial representation of the data points we get uh, for each of these processes. When you see the cycling time, for instance, represented and the OEE and also the mean absolute error in terms of the quality of the part. So um, this summer, actually, uh, I think a little, like, yeah, one month ago, we started, um, so we, meaning me and um, my, my, my intern for the summer, CEO from uh, Penn State, uh, she works with uh, Frank Ritter. Uh, we started to design um, a model we call the chip Actar, which probably is not, you know, it doesn't sound right in English because like you don't want a chip version of Actar, um, uh, which is applied to this continuous improvement process in Bosch production system. And so we have two versions right now, this model. Uh, we already actually submitted a paper uh, for version one, which is, uh, I would say, more basic uh, um, uh, model uh, uh, that uses, um, you know, uh, rule-based, so production-based system a lot, uh, and where we try to distinguish uh, within novice, intermediate, and expert decision combinations, depending on the feedback that we get from, from the environment. Um, and then what we observe, what we look in this model, particularly what we look for is how the model over time um, learns to uh, switch from uh, novice decision, novice-like decisions to more expert decisions. So you can see, uh, you know, a learning curve uh, over time. The second version of the model that we've been working on for a couple of weeks now incorporate some metacognitive processes of you know reflecting and evaluating uh, um, the progress of the different approaches and here we have introduced uh, some reward functions um, that can uh, you know be used uh, in the, in typical you know actar fashion to uh, uh, redistribute uh, the utilities uh, across the production system framework um Right, so this is yeah, a little bit of a representation of uh, how the, the version 1.0 um, uh, learns uh, over over time to um, uh, apply uh, expert-based productions. Um, so I don't think we need to go into the details, but uh, you know we run the model 15 times, 15, 16 trials per time, and then we decide we basically. Um, uh, represent the decisions uh, uh, types, decision types as a zero, one, and two for novice, intermediate, and expert strategies, and and we see that you know over time, uh, um, you know we we reach uh, um, so the model reaches a level of expertise that allows to uh, to to pick the correct decision um, for you know again uh, with the with the focus of uh, understanding where to intervene pre-assembly or assembly uh, with uh, with good accuracy. For the uh, version 2.0, which uh, for now we we still don't have, uh, uh, we are not ready right now to to show any any particular you know um, uh, any, any significant results in this sense. We are still running the simulations and trying to interpret uh, well the the uh, the overall outcomes. We we have developed a penalty propagation mechanisms um, and a reward mechanism for novice and expert. Um, which stems from the headcount cost uh, uh, inefficient decision. So, of course, you know, if uh, if you start uh, so intuitively, you know, if uh, if you have to um, augment uh, significantly the number of headcounts uh, uh, to uh, reduce the cycling time of a machine, that is called an inefficient decision. And when the model picks that, uh, we uh, penalize the all the productions that uh, are related to that particular um, uh, to that particular decision point. And so this allows the model to um, refine uh, its own decisions over time and optimize those. Um, so uh, this is one slide, but I can spend a little bit of time here. So, uh, you know, we are trying to develop this system uh, for our, um, deployment in a real use case. And you know, it's, I would say, you know, using an euphemism that, you know, interacting with cognitive models is, is not the most user-friendly experience. Um, uh, of course, you know, you can build the front ends, you can try to abstract from the, um, the, the, the interactions uh, or the type of uh, triggers that you use to, to, um, to have the model make some predictions and, and selections. 
Um, However, you know, we we recognize, uh, you know, that uh, here uh, the uh, the role that the large models can play is uh, is very is very important. And so, as in the past, uh, we have seen that uh, you can take a, a knowledge resource and uh, um, transform it into a, a format, into a latent representation that can be used to induce that knowledge uh, context into uh, um, sub-symbolic systems. Our research question was, can we do the same with uh, um, with cognitive models? So can we translate the behavior of cognitive models, the um, uh, predictions, the classifications, uh, the recommendations provided by the cognitive models alongside with the, the, the way the micro decisions that these models do? So in ACTAR terms, for instance, the trace of the model, can we transform these uh, knowledge, which is a knowledge of our quality model, achieves uh, a certain goal into a format that uh, a large model can um, absorb and behaviorally reproduce uh, when prompted. And so that's where we are uh, looking at the integration between large models and uh, cognitive architecture, which, by the way, is something that um, uh, I personally started investigating uh, as a as a as part of what I do, you know, uh, at Bosch Research, but there was a very interesting uh, full symposium um, last year exactly on this topic. So uh, it was, um, you know, uh, um, I think the title was an Integration of Cognitive Architectures and Large Models or something like that, um, where, you know, the question is, is still very open. So how do we integrate, uh, uh, what are the best ways to integrate uh, a cognitive architecture and, and a large model? And uh, yeah, I don't think there is an answer yet because there are different levels in which this integration can occur. Can it can be again as more like a, uh, so using the large models, for instance, as a extension of a of the declarative memory of a model, uh, or using it even to generate uh, um, to generate productions or or other uh, um, I would say structures that are using a cognitive model. So here we are taking an approach that is still kind of vanilla, uh, I believe. But we are, as we speak, uh, empirically testing how vanilla it is and how and how far uh, is uh, uh, taking us in terms of the task that we want to uh, to execute. Um, and so, um, to to go back to the slide per se, um, so you know the the current so our thinking is you know high level reasoning can only be achieved by an integrated solution. There's no silver bullet. There's no one uh, one approach that can solve that. Especially when we look at the you know the case of working AI, and um, this integration of systems and approaches that can generate uh, uh, um, high level reasoning in the future seem very safe to say that uh, it is methodologically variegated and task dependent. Um, and so in our current work, uh, we we are trying to look at a level of integration, which is um, uh, the answer to the question, can we improve an LLM by infusing at scale knowledge of cognitive processes underlying human-like decisions? Um, and one, uh, so the current effort that we are making is uh, based on um, the improvement of LAMA, course, it's open source, so it's easy to test uh, this hypothesis with an open source system like this. We are using LAMA2 at this point. And so the approach is actually uh, the following. Uh, the sketch here perhaps is not super meaningful, but I, I can unpack it a little bit for you. So the idea is that you know we, we can run uh, you know uh, uh, countless simulations of uh, cognitive model version 1 or 2, the Chipaktar model of these decision processes. And what that gives us is you know, a variability across uh, uh, the problem and how they um, can be solved uh, um, by a human or by a system that can replicate a human uh, uh, with, the, with high confidence. So at that point, we can translate uh, uh, the um, outcomes from the model and the, the trace, so how that outcome have uh, been um, generated by by ACTAR and by the cognitive model at the at the um, micro decision steps. So looking at you know 
the uh, how the different modules are involved, uh, the different productions are involved, how the utility get propagate gets propagated uh, uh, on the basis of the reward function when we look at uh, the version 2.0. So we can actually um, translate uh, all this knowledge into a format that is um, that can be digested by Lama, which means, of course, a latent uh, semantic representations, where, of course, a latent semantic representation loses uh, the richness, the semantic richness that uh, the explicit representation contain. But that's, you know, the, the nature of the business, so-called, when you do neurosymbolic AI. And so after, let's say, um, after uh, this uh, uh, new form of representation of the cognitive model behavior and internal mechanisms, what we can do is actually, you know, mimicking other approaches in uh, different uh, domains, uh, we can actually fine tune last layer of, uh, uh, of the large model. The last layer and the last layers in general are where you do fine tuning because they are those that are more, you know, semantically salient for a task at end. And so at that point, what you can do is, um, uh, so by fine tuning these models with this cognitively salient uh, uh, data, what you expect is trivially that when you prompt them to solve a specific task that is based on the data you have fine tuned them with, they are much better than the uh, pre-trained version of the large model without any fine tuning. And so we observe these uh, in the state of the art across various uh, applications, but we haven't much looked at that at the level of integration of cognitive models. There is one work we refer to um, as, a, as an example of this approach, but it doesn't use cognitive model, uh, models. It uses uh, behavioral data collected from human studies. And this is a paper by Marcel Binth uh, I think the title is uh, Towards um, uh, towards uh, Cognitive Large Models or something like that. And so where again, he uses a, a similar approach of fine tuning the last layer, but instead of that using, you know, uh, uh, simulated data like we are doing here, it uses, you know, a, a distilled version of different uh, behavioral studies in cognitive psychology and the data that were collected on those. And so here, they, I would say the final uh, the final um, outcome that we we envision and, and we are you know aiming to 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 have is a system that you can prompt with the problem how to reduce production time keeping headcount stable, providing this system as part of the prompt also the data that represent uh, a particular uh, I would say snapshot of a of a um, uh, of a power plant uh, production processes and workflow in a particular um, scenario, and then having the model being able not only to predict the correct decisions, but also to distill an explanation that is based on the actual decisions and on the uh, internal cognitive state that we, um, uh, we reduced uh, into uh, latent representations uh, for the large language models to, to be able to, again, uh, um, uh, enforce that type of constraints in the prediction. Um, and last but not least, uh, we just, you know, mention uh, some of the collaborators that over the years have helped, uh, uh, have helped me shaping, you know, some of these ideas, starting from uh, uh, the question answering tasks using knowledge infusion with the large models, uh, and you know, to this day, with uh, more focused on uh, on how we can uh, integrate cognitive architectures uh, into these systems, with the idea that cognitive architectures are an important element, uh, 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 an essential element to achieve uh, a form of high-level reasoning that mimics uh, how human reason. And uh, you know, uh, these uh, collaborators mostly are, are based on different universities here in the U.S. Um, and uh, CMU, uh, South, Carolina, South California, South Carolina, Penn State, uh, and, and Kansas State University. Cool. So uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, and you know, if there is uh, any question, I would be happy to 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 answer it. To take it. 
So thank you, Alessandro. Uh, great talk. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mike, okay. Are there questions? Yeah, Ken. Sandro, I was wondering. Again. Um, I, so, are you familiar with the um, elemental cognition LLM sandwich model for using these systems? Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with uh, what elemental cognition uh, does. Uh, I don't think I'm familiar with this particular bot, though. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the the clever move is you have a symbolic reasoner, and the inputs and domain theories are couched in a, in a very tightly controlled version of English. And so use an LLM to work with developers to build that specification, and they can read the specification, right? So the formal, the, the quote formal language looks English-like, and then they run the constraint solver on particular problems, and then the humans who are customers can also read the outputs from the constraint system, because again, it's expressed in a carefully controlled English that then the LLM is used to produce stuff on the output side. So they avoid compatibilization by having a, a hardcore symbolic reasoner and a, a processing, basically a compiler-like process to handle its outputs. Okay. It's, it, it, just, it just seems like a, it seems like there's a class of neurosymbolic models in there that are using an LLM for what it's actually really good at, language to language, um, and symbolic stuff for what they're really good at. As opposed mm -hmm. to trying to make the the poor LLM jump over and and do reasoning. No, that's interesting. I, I will look in, into that. Um, you know, in fact, you know what I didn't stress enough is is this last bullet point here. So I think that a more systematic integration uh, is needed. Uh, more systematic meaning, you know, uh, more than what we are doing right now to which is a kind of you know. Uh, straightforward. So it, there is there is no innovation here. You take some some knowledge, some uh, which in, in this case is knowledge extracted from a cognitive model execution, let's say, and you reduce it to a format where you can use to fine tune. But this is a sort of kind of fusion, which uh, I don't think will achieve anything in terms of high level reasoning, because again, it goes back, it falls back to the problem that if you use knowledge to fine tune a model, you don't tell the model how to use the knowledge for reasoning. So my 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 personal belief here is that, uh, you know, uh, you need to have a system where the neuro symbolic, uh, the neural and symbolic parts are decoupled. Uh, decoupled, and I know that the elemental cognition, for instance, you know, has a sort of symbolic reasoner that they use uh, uh, that works on top of what the large language model do, and which again it seems to go into the direction that of the chatbot that you just described. And uh, I think that is the approach that is more promising, and where eventually, you know, when we look at how the project that I described will move forward, we will have different baselines, and I would assume that at some point our best system will be a system that is significantly different from what we are developing right now. And again, tries to uh, to, to keep the, 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 the symbolic AI aspect uh, where it belongs and the same for the large models. Question? I had a quick question. Early on, you talked about the continuous improvement process and you likened it to the OODA loop a little bit. The interesting step for me that I saw was plan, and rather than generate a solution, which I expected, it actually said identify the problem, which instead of corresponding to the decide part of the OODA loop would be more orient, I would believe. So can you explain the, the confusion there? And if orient, um, I normally think of being done by a person. Was any of that automated? And if so, where in the process you were talking about? So, is your question about a mismatch between what I showed in the in the CIP and the, UDA, the the analogy with the UDA loop? So there is no. So there are some mismatches in the in the analogy that I use. That's what what you mean there. I'm interested in the idea of the recognize the problem 
and the Orient aspect of it, which is what was printed there. And I didn't know if you could talk to that. Right. No, no, this is a nice, uh, this is a, you know, interesting observation there. Um, I have to think about that, to be honest with you. Uh, I, you know, I, I think the Orient, the Orient stage um, is something you can use decision augmentation systems for, right? Because they, 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 they can provide with the analytics uh, or in form of recommendations, um, an announcement of the orientation that otherwise would be only based on the human. Uh, but I haven't given enough thought of, uh, you know, uh, how how that can be um, a little bit uh, revised in terms of what you said. I think that's a valid comment and remark, and I have to think about that, though. I don't have a ready answer for you, but thanks for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I have uh, many questions, so I will start with the first one. So first one is um, in the models that you are uh, going to uh, to build. You your choice was on uh, Actar. So my question is, right. you know, there are many cognitive architectures yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, out there. So yeah. uh, why Actar? Do you think yeah. it is particularly, let's say, suitable for this kind of neurosymbolic integration? Right. Why not other cognitive architectures? So this is the first one. So I will. Yeah, yeah, and this is. Um something i should have said in one slide so you know we we try to comply with the common model of cognition uh, uh, and so actar in this sense is just a uh, one architecture that we could have chosen among the others that uh, i would say relate to that so we are interested of course you know we, we chose actar because of familiarity that we both have uh, me and my intern with the architecture but our idea is that okay let's uh, let's take uh, a system that, uh, um, let's say, uh, represents some of the main uh, processes in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, cognition, which are recognized by the community. And again, we look at the CMC as a, as a reference here. Okay, thank you. So second question that I have. Uh, so you mentioned that you are using actually the, the, the trace, right, the result of the model. Yeah as something that you put back, let's say, in the LLM via a uh, um, latent based representation, so right. something something similar. Yeah. But then you uh, said that you wanted to uh, have, let's say, the result that you obtain for, from these, let's say, enhanced model that could, uh, could be explainable. So what do you mean by explainable here in, in the sense that when you have this transformation, you are losing some let's say, explicit grounding, semantic grounding. So how do you, uh, let's say, um, achieve yeah. this, let's say, explainability that you were talking about? Yes. Um, OK, so the first part of your question. Um, so this is something we are working on. Uh, we haven't figured out yet how you can, so what or, uh, out of the trace can be used uh, and can be informative enough for the model uh, for the fine tuning in this particular case, because of course a, a trace, uh, if you look at, you know, it's, the scale is in milliseconds, 50 milliseconds per decision, more or less. And so when you look at the combining that with the outcome of the decision, the scale of the um, uh, of, of the of the of the workflow is very different. So right now we are look we are actually as of yesterday we started discussing how to generalize over what we see in the trace, which is a, a micro level so called. And you can actually generalize to, to represent these processes at the higher cognitive level, which is uh, something we believe the large model will be able to pick up on a little bit better than you know showing every step in the in the trace, which is too fine grained. Let's say. Uh, that being said, uh, I think you know what you said is very is very um, is very true. So the moment where you have everything uh, as a vector. And you use that vector as part of the um, uh, of the subsymbolic system and the fine tuning. You kind of lose uh, the explainability that you have in the explicit side. So in the in the in the in the, in the trace and in the model itself. Um, however, you know, uh, drawing a parallel with knowledge graphs, you do the same, right? So when you when you use a knowledge graph in combination with a large model. Um, and you have a sort of a prediction uh, made by the model for a specific question answering task, for instance, you can always pinpoint uh, 
from the answer, so from the you know manifestation of the uh, model prediction, you can pinpoint the concepts in the graph that were used. Uh, uh, and so we, we believe, again, this is very fresh and ongoing uh, problem. We believe that we can develop mechanisms that connect back the prediction to the cognitive steps that we, we generalized over from the trace. Okay. Are there any any other question? No. So thank you very much, Alessandro, for this great talk. It was good to see that you know Actar is used is starting to be used also in real production, let's say uh, scenarios, and uh, I think this, this is a very interesting application. So thank you very much for thank the talk. Thank you very much for for having me, Antonio, and everybody. Okay. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. So